All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the final talk of EscarpCon, day three. Um, I'm Nate Ferguson, one of the co-founders of Escarpment Labs. Today we have Richard Priest again with us, um, who's also one of the co-founders of Escarpment Labs, and today we're going to be talking about Diastaticus 101. Um, now, a little background on this talk. This is a talk that both Richard and I have given a handful of times. We kind of traded it back and forth, you know, on occasion, so to speak. Uh, today we landed on Richard giving the talk, but I'll be probably jumping in once we're done to answer a handful of other questions for it and kind of prodding a bit further into it. Um, just so everyone's aware, uh, next week we are probably taking a little bit of time off. We're not, we won't be publishing anything uh, active next week, but the following week we'll be back kind of at business as usual, probably Mondays or you know, two, two uploads a week or so, give or take, uh, pending everyone everything that goes on in the environment. Um, if you haven't caught on, if, if this is the first time you're, you're uh, Watch one of these. Thanks for thanks for taking some time with us. Uh, we have about fifteen plus hours of content on our YouTube channel, but we generate the last little while. And I would recommend you go look at look through some of that information if you want more. Uh, and without further ado, Richard, I'll pass it on to you, and let's get started. Diastaticus one hundred and one. Excellent. Thanks, Nate. Let me just get this thing up here. All right. Uh, it's always good to start things off with uh, with a meme, right? Um, any Lizzo fans in the house? I sure hope so, because uh, I feel like uh, our social media has a lot of Lizzo references, and uh, it's some fun, positive music that we need right now. Um, just uh, up front, I want to acknowledge some of the people that have sort of helped us uh, be able to put this presentation together um, and study uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae diastaticus. Um, which is what this presentation is about. Um, Alex Mitro, uh, who you just saw present on uh, lab tests you can do without a lab, uh, did a great job with that presentation. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I know you were a little nervous. So I think you knocked it out of the park. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Isabel Neto, who uh, we had on here last week uh, presenting about Lactobacillus Blend 2.0 and uh, um, this big Lactobacillus project that we did. Um, they both helped us with uh, method development uh, screening techniques and research for um, the diastaticus strains that we have in-house at the yeast lab. I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, two past co-op students, Shelby Stein and Jill Ewan. Um, they both uh, did some projects uh, during their co-op terms, um, characterizing some of these yeasts using the PCR. Uh, we sort of treated, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we like to do for the co-ops is train them uh, so that they have these lab skills that they can use in the future in their careers. and. Uh, um, they were both able to uh, do some of this work on diastaticus and uh, help us out as well. So this is the problem we're talking about. Who has seen this? You may not have seen, you know, a, a bulging or exploding can, uh, a can that's happy to see you um, in person, but you've probably heard about it, right? Um, this happens more often than, than we would like, uh, where you have cans of beer, uh, or bottles of beer that overpressurize, um, end up warping or, or even exploding. Um, you know, at best, this can cause a mess. You know, this can be a real problem. Someone's got to clean and scrub the roof of their, of their kitchen. Um, at worst, people can actually get hurt. There have been cases of uh, people who have been cut by um, bursting cans um, that have required hospital visits. So um, this is sort of uh, one, of, one of the big parts of the problem here when we're talking about diastatic yeast is there is a risk of this scenario happening, of, of cans bursting and uh, causing a problem. So what are the potential causes of bursting? Um, the first one could be the physical failure of can seams. Um, cans are seamed in a specific way um, if there is an issue with the seaming of the can, it can cause uh, cans to leak or burst. And that's why uh, brewers that are, that are uh, canning their beer um, will often cut up a can and check the seam uh, to make sure that it's been seamed correctly. Um, another way that this can happen, you know, regardless of diastaticus, is uh, beer can be packaged before the terminal gravity if there's yeast present. Um, this does happen every so often. Um, we have heard of cases of it, you know, for example, there's a brewery that's run out of beer, they really need to get beer out the door, it's the middle of the summer, everyone's thirsty, um, that beer gets crashed maybe a little bit before it's done, um, you know, gets sent on to packaging, it's not sterile filtered, it's not pasteurized, that beer sits on a shelf, you know, in a, in a, in a retail store, uh, warm for, for a couple weeks and, and blows up because there's still yeast and fermentable sugar left in there. 
Um, so that can be a problem easily avoided by um, doing the force ferments like we talked about earlier and also just by um, you know recording your data uh, making sure you understand your trends and where your where your FG is supposed to be um, we also you know tried to hammer home that concept as well is uh, data is power these days um, another potential issue and we've seen this uh, much more recently especially in um, the American craft beer scene where beers packaged with added sugar uh, through fruit juice or puree uh, as well as with yeast present um, there seems to be this dangerous trend of slushy beers or slurpy beers or whatever the hell you call them where where these these breweries are putting in unfermented juice uh in with the 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 beer and basically shoveling the responsibility onto the customer and saying well you know it's your job to keep it cold dummy don't be that brewery that's stupid uh please don't do that uh if you do that i guarantee you at some point someone's gonna get hurt and someone's gonna get sued um, so that is a potential issue with, uh, with can bursting as well, or package bursting. Um, another, another, uh, potential cause is hop derived amylase coming, causing a re-fermentation. So this has been referred to as hop creep. That's sort of become the, uh, standard term for that in our industry. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of an interesting one too, because, because there were a lot of cases where it was hard to tell, um, you, you know, you'd get these. Uh, beers that were over carbonating, but you go and you look at the yeast and it's, you know, there's no diastaticus there. So like, what the heck's going on? And it was found in some of these cases that it was actually enzymes coming from the hops in the dry hopping, um, amylase enzymes breaking down some of the starches and dextrins in the beer, um, creating some fermentable sugars that allow the yeast to continue to ferment in package and over carbonate that beer. So there's a lot of potential causes of bursting and it's always important um, upstream uh, to do the uh, root cause analysis as much as possible to understand what might be the potential root cause of a beer that's uh, over carbonating or bursting um, before the finger gets pointed at diastatic yeast. But of course, you know, the, the fifth potential cause of um, package bursting is, is a beer that is packaged at a stable terminal gravity, but it may have a uh, cross contamination with a um, diastatic Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. So we do have some general proactive suggestions um, that could, could avoid a lot of these issues. And unfortunately, these are not suggestions that necessarily align with um, the philosophy of craft beer. And I, I understand that. Um, you know, one easy option is sterile filter the beer. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the, in the um, non-alcoholic beer talk, this doesn't necessarily uh, mitigate all potential risk, right? Uh, anywhere after that sterile filter is still a potential uh, cause of contamination and a critical control point. Um, so for example, if you're, if you're sterile filtering and then um, going into a canning line, that canning line is still a potential uh, vector for cross-contamination. Uh, another option is pasteurizing your beer. This is you know, a very safe option. Um, I really hope that a lot of those brewers that are putting juice in their cans are um, starting to think about investing in pasteurizers. Um, uh, you know, even, even if it's just a relatively simple tunnel pasteurizer, uh, pasteurize the beer that's in the cans um, so that it is uh, shelf stable and not liable to exploding. Um, that is a possibility. Of course, there is a trade-off in terms of flavor um, potentially being uh, reduced or destroyed by, by exposure to heat. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's, it is important as much as possible to implement a micro QC program. Uh, as Alex Mitro talked about earlier, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to invest tens of thousands of dollars in a fully equipped lab. Uh, you can get up and running for you know surprisingly low amount of effort and cost. And and we always encourage people to try this out. We know a lot of small breweries. Uh, you know even even if your production staff is only four or five people that have been able to implement uh, micro QC program. And we're always happy to help brewers uh, who want to sort of conceptualize that and get that off the ground. And of course, this has been in the news. Um, there's been a lot of uh, documented cases where um, diastatic yeast causing exploding packages or other issues uh, with the beer um, have become public. And I can tell you that a lot of these have remained private as well, but there have been public cases of beers that are recalled uh, as well as lawsuits as a result of um, the, the presence of, of diastatic yeast in beers. So why is this a problem now? Why have we only been talking about diastaticus really for the last three years? 
Um, part of this is that there has been a higher usage of diastatic Saison yeast in breweries. I would say about four years or so ago um, is really when Saison started to become a more popular style for, for breweries to be making, especially in the summer months where uh, people really want these light, dry, uh, crushable beers. Um, Saison yeasts are you know, famous for having just a, a lot of flavor, um, but able to make a, you know, a, a low final gravity, uh, low, low calorie beer. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, another, you know, thing maybe working against this is that there has been in, in those four years, a very rapid growth of a lot of breweries, um, especially in North America. And that rapid growth is, is a challenge because it may leave, uh, QC programs. It may leave SOPs catching up, right? Um, if, uh, if, a, if a brewery has to rapidly scale up, um, but they're focusing on the brew house and the tanks and they're not focusing on uh, the lab or the safety or the SOPs, uh, sometimes things get missed and that can result in some problems. And so uh, I think this is sort of one of the growing pains of the craft beer industry is um, a lot of these businesses having, having you know, grown really quickly and now um, sort of trying to circle back and tighten up quality, tighten up um, consistency. Um, another challenging area that I see. And, you know, this is one that, that is kind of hard to avoid is that a lot of the canning packaging lines on the market can't be heat sanitized. Um, these are great devices. It's a way for a brewery to start canning, to have an automated canning line for, uh, you know, a lot less than the million plus dollars that the, the previous generation costed. But this comes at a trade off, right? These things have parts that cannot be heat sanitized. You know, you can't just heat it to 85 C and assume that, you know, most things are dead. Um, and that can cause a risk for cross contamination. So there is a need to, uh, to uh, make sure that the um, cleaning SOPs are both are both in place and validated if you're using some of these uh, smaller canning lines. So why is this a problem now? Uh, diastatic yeast has emerged as a high risk contaminant in craft beer. Um, they cause a significant loss and safety risk due to their ability to ferment sugars and starches beyond the capabilities of normal brewing yeast. That's really the problem here, right? Is that you can have a beer that's finished at like 10, 10, 2.5 Play-Doh. Ordinarily for most yeasts and most beers, that would be stable, right? You put it in a, you put it in a can, uh, you ship it off. Ideally it's cold stored. Uh, we all know, especially those of us in Ontario, um, it doesn't always get cold stored. It might sit on, you know, a warm shelf um, somewhere at a government retail store. And uh, if there's a couple cells, you know, I think this this meme is actually about Brett. But if you know, if you've got one funky boy in there, uh, it can cause some big problems for you. Um, and, and that that um, is one of the challenges here is that a very small contamination by diastatic yeast can cause a really big problem for a brewery. Um, in terms of the diastatic yeast that we see, some of these are wild yeasts and some of these are commercial Saison yeast. So, so you, can, you can see either one, right? Uh, in some instances, it's something that does seem to be um, quite wild uh, in nature, especially if you look at uh, the history sort of pre-craft beer of this stuff showing up in uh, macro breweries. Um, it, you know, it exists there as well, but, uh, a lot of the cases that have happened in, in craft breweries are, um, cross-contamination by Saison yeast. And the way that we detect it typically is through agar plating or PCR, um, and ideally both. So if we're talking about diastatic yeast and trying to pass some knowledge on to you guys, there are some key questions we can ask. Um, I tried to put in the, uh, the gif here of, um, where Bart shakes up the beer for April Fool's Day and uh, like shakes it up, you know, extremely and and Homer opens it up and it explodes the whole house. Um, but for whatever reason, um, Google Slides wouldn't play the GIF. So we got this one instead. Still had to get some Simpsons content in there. Um, <laughs> we're going to answer the question, what is diastatic yeast? Are some diastatic yeast higher risk than others? How do we detect it? How do we prevent it? What do we do if we have it? Right. What's the risk? And then also, of course, you know, the elephant in the room, what are the yeast suppliers doing about this problem? So what is diastatic? As I've said this word a lot, but I haven't really defined it yet, have I? Um, the scientific term that you'll, you'll usually see floated around is Saccharomyces cerevisiae var diastaticus, um, or simply diastatic yeast. 
that definition is sort of changing because we know that this isn't anything special. It's not like a subspecies or anything like that. The only difference is that it just has one special gene. So really it is Saccharomyces cerevisiae with a gene that gives it diastatic properties. So we usually just call it at this point, diastatic Saccharomyces, diastatic Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, historically, it's been thought to be a wild yeast. Um, we'll see later on that that, that may not be the case, um, but typically it, you know, it's considered to be sort of a wild yeast contamination. Um, but again, we go and we look at these yeasts and, and in general, they are relatively normal yeasts, but they have this nifty new glucoamylase. Uh, the gene is called STA1. It encodes an enzyme um, that can break down starch, produce glucose. And that is how you can have, you know, a beer with a stable final gravity. If this stuff gets in it, it can uh, convert some of those starches into sugars, ferment those sugars and overcarbonate that beer. So it's actually kind of a cool thing. The STA1 gene is a hybrid. It is a hybrid of two um, totally different uh, functioning yeast genes um, that do different things in the cell. And when you combine those two things, you get a different result. I think this is actually a really cool thing. Um, and hybrid uh, genes in general, hybrid proteins are, are kind of interesting in the, in the yeast cell because this might be a way that the yeast can um, evolve new functions. And in the case of STA1, that seems to be what has happened. So what you have here is you have this gene SGA1 um, that creates a glucoamylase that exists only inside the cell. Um, it's used to break down carbohydrates inside the cell. Um, for example, the cell needs to break down things like uh, glycogen um, to survive or to uh, generate spores. Um, that helps um, the cell to, to do those functions, but it doesn't leave the cell. But then you also have this thing combined with part of this gene called flow 11. And what that is, is that's a glycoprotein or a flocculin that sits on the outside of the cell surface. Um, it, it, like many of the other genes that are, that are, that are called flow genes, there's a bunch of them. Um, these are all related to the cells flocculating. So flocculation is actually a really complicated trait in yeast in the sense that there seems to be a lot of genes that are involved, a lot of proteins that are involved in controlling flocculation and flow 11 is just one of those. Um, so if you take that SGA1, that inside the cell glucoamylase, you combine it with flow 11, that cell surface glycoprotein, what you end up with is now a glucoamylase that sits outside the cell. So you've changed the function because um, now, now, now you're exposing this um, enzyme function to the exterior of the cell. So now um, that yeast cell, it's got a little bit of starch outside it. It is suddenly able to break down that starch um, convert it to sugar and ferment that sugar. So it, it has, uh, in being a hybrid of these two genes, we've created a new function that the yeast is now capable of. So just to illustrate that, this is what it looks like in a normal yeast. We have our flow 11 sitting on the outside, uh, our SGA1 on the inside that's there if the cell needs to, uh, needs, needs to break down carbohydrates inside the cell and uh, as part of sporulation. Um, and say, for example, we've got some starch molecules out here uh, in our beer. Uh, this STA1 negative yeast is not going to touch these starch molecules. Um, and so our, our, our final gravity should be relatively stable in this circumstance. But when we have that STA1 positive yeast, if we've slapped flow 11 and SGA1 together to create STA1, um, this sort of uh, enzyme hybrid, uh, we can take that starch that can be broken down into glucose, we can have a secondary fermentation, and that's where a lot of these problems come from. So I sort of alluded to this earlier, uh, trying to answer the question, you know, where does diastaticus come from? Uh, we've always assumed that it's a wild yeast, but some modern DNA sequencing done, um, and this is um, some work that was uh, captained by Christopher Krogeris, uh, we had him presenting on Monday on lager yeast. Um, he also did this fantastic paper on STA1 as well. Um, I think I saw him uh, in the chat earlier as well. So uh, thanks for uh, listening in, Christopher. And if I get anything wrong, please make sure that I'm aware and I'll try to correct it. Um, fantastic paper. I really think that uh, this is something that the beer industry was not looking at really uh, for about 20 years. And you know, in one fell swoop, this paper kind of just brought us up to date, right? Um, all of the pieces that needed to really uh, come into place um, to get us, you know, back into the modern age with diastaticus and start solving problems. 
Um, so one thing that that was done in this project was um, they fished for uh, STA1 in all of the available uh, yeast genome sequences that are out there. Now there's uh, more than a thousand whole whole yeast genome sequences that are publicly accessible. Uh, they they sort of looked through all of those and found that it only showed up in two groups. It showed up in their beer two group. Um, and if we recall from earlier, that's our a lot of our Belgian yeasts. Um, they're more closely related to the wine yeasts. Um, they have a lot of those kind of, uh, uh, you know, wine yeast like traits, like being able to tolerate higher temperatures and things like that. Um, and all of the Saison yeast fall into that family. Um, and all of these Saison yeasts are STA1 positive for the most part. Um, and interestingly enough, they also found STA1 in a totally different population of um, clinical isolates from humans in French Guinea. Um, and as to why this uh, hybrid gene only shows up in these two distinct uh, yeast populations is kind of still a mystery, but I, I thought that was interesting and, and worth mentioning that this is actually a pretty rare trait among, uh, among Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeasts um, and does seem to mostly only show up in our, in our Saison yeasts. But detecting this stuff is really hard. So um, the ordinary approach that we take as microbiologists in the lab is, you know, let's get a special type of agar that we can use so we can select for uh, a certain type of organism and make sure that if we're plating our sample and uh, we want to detect that organism, it shows up. That's like a super common approach. We'll use some kind of selective agar for that. But that's kind of hard here because this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. If, if we're plating a yeast sample or a beer sample, we're probably gonna get Saccharomyces cerevisiae to grow. And how the heck do we separate diastatic Saccharomyces cerevisiae from non-diastatic Saccharomyces cerevisiae? It's really hard. So if we're to use a, you know, a general purpose agar medium like WLN here, um, you, you may not see any visual differences between, for example, the colonies of a STA1 positive yeast and an STA1 negative yeast. So we have to get a little bit more complicated when we're looking to di detect diastaticus um, because those obvious physical differences don't exist. Like if you were to take a, a you know, a Brett, for example, and plate it on this, you'd actually see differences. The, the colonies themselves actually look different. So that makes it almost easier to detect. Um, because we don't have those obvious physical differences, we're left with other options. So we have to either detect the presence of the gene or we have to find some way to select for diastatic yeast specifically. Um, so we can detect the gene through PCR um, using, using these devices called thermocyclers, um, or we can, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, uh, or we can plate onto agar. So this is, I think, uh, probably something general purpose, uh, just showing uh, what it looks like when you don't wash your hands for 30 seconds in warm soapy water. So make sure you do that uh, every time, especially before and after you leave your house. Um, very important. Um, also important to uh, uh, that we can use these tools to uh, check our beer for contaminants as well. So how does PCR work? You probably hear people talk about this all the time. Um, I suspect that there's more people than are willing to admit that don't quite understand what this is or how it works. And for that reason, we're actually planning um, a full webinar on PCR um, so that brewers can get up to speed um, and understand the ins and outs of PCR um, and how they can implement it in their brewery. Uh, but just at its most basic, what PCR does, the polymerase chain reaction, uh, what it does is it amplifies genes. You can start with you know, a couple uh, pieces of DNA, you can make a copy, you can make a copy, you can make a copy, and that grows exponentially each time, right? Uh, just like how we, when we grow yeast, you know, one cell buds to become two, those two bud to become four, you know, we have that exponential growth. Um, we'd see the same thing with PCR. So starting from a very small amount of genetic material, we're able to create uh, a lot of genetic material to the point where we can actually visualize it. And so, if we're thinking about PCR in the context of diastaticus, what we can do here is we can take a sample of yeast and ask the question, is the STA1 gene present? You know, we can try to amplify that STA1 gene from the yeast and uh, determine whether or not it's present. So what do the results look like? Um, there are a lot of different types of PCR. Um, and I'm not going to get into those, you know, all of those different things. Like there is quantitative PCR, um, there is um, RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR, um, where you're quantifying things like RNA. So if you're trying to quantify uh, 
Um, an RNA virus, for example, that's the technique you would be using most of the time. Um, when we're looking at diastaticus, it's actually relatively simple. Uh, most of the time we can detect it just using a standard regular PCR, what's called endpoint PCR, because we're only measuring uh, what happens at the end of the reaction. Um, so just to provide an example of what that can look like, um, and you may have seen these kinds of images before, right? Uh, these glowing bands um, in a box. That's that's a pretty standard agarose gel, uh, pretty standard way to separate DNA, uh, measure it, um, especially when we're looking at things like presence and absence here. So for example, uh, with this one, and, and it looks like the, uh, the gel wasn't run for very long to separate the latter. So um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna scold whoever made this right now, but uh, I would recommend uh, for those of us who are, who are running gels in the lab, run it a little longer so we can see the latter and confirm that band size. Um, <laughs> in this example, um, if we're seeing a band, that means that this uh, thing that we're trying to detect, in this case, it is STA1, uh, that means that that is present. So in this example, samples two, as well as samples four through seven would be STA1 positive, and sample three and eight would be STA1 negative. Um, this is really useful because this tells us that the gene is present, but this is also not necessarily very useful because it only tells us the gene is present. It doesn't tell us that there's live active diastaticus. Uh, it just tells us that yes, that, that genetic material is there. Um, so that is one of the limitations here. Um, a lot of the commercially available solutions that are out there um, that brewers have access to also work this way. Um, they may simplify some of this process. So you may have something like a lateral flow assay um, that, that, you know, kind of works like a pregnancy test to, um, detect that amplicon. Um, but these, these are working in very similar ways. Um, and in general, if we're looking at, uh, endpoint PCR of, uh, of a yeast culture, um, we've been able to see sensitivity to about one in one in a hundred million cells. So that's actually pretty good, uh, sensitivity. That being said, if you, you know, you think of a commercial yeast culture and it's got, uh, you know, 10 heck pitch would have 10 trillion cells. You recognize that there's still, you know, some some possibility of of uh, of, of low level diastatic contamination that, that could not be detected. And we're going to talk about proactive measures to even avoid the risk of this in the first place because of that gap. So another option we have is detecting the function, right? We talked about detecting the gene. We can also look for the gene's function. Um, so these are some images of some uh, agar plates that we made that contain starch, um, as well as a pH indicator. So uh, if that starch is consumed, um, that pH indicator changes to yellow. And uh, that is an indication that, that, that there has been starch degradation by that yeast. Um, so we were able to use this, um, this medium um, and I think I have a reference to it in the next slide. Um, the idea for this medium came from a lab at, at Weinstefan in Germany. Um, we were able to use this to characterize some of the yeast that we had that contained um, the STA1 gene. Um, and we were able to uh, get some indication of, you know, how active they were. And like, interestingly enough, we noticed that some of them were able to, to convert the starch quite quickly and quite well. And other ones were not doing very much at all. They had very little starch degradation. Um, so that was like interesting because, you know, STA1 until that point was considered to be kind of a binary trait, right? Like either the yeast has it and it's going to be a huge problem or the yeast doesn't have it and it's, it's no, no big deal. Um, this suggested to us that there might be something, uh, deeper here, uh, among other reports from other brewers and yeast labs saying like, you know, some of these diastatic strains don't really do much, but the others are really aggressive. So that led to some really good research questions. Uh, one thing that I just did want to flag for this kind of starch degradation approach is that um, these take a really long time for incubation. Um, for this, this plate media to work, we had to incubate it anaerobically, and it would take about three weeks to really see clear results on here. So as a quality control mechanism, we can't wait three weeks to, you know, to hold fresh yeast. We can't wait three weeks uh, to hold beer in most cases. So it's not necessarily the most effective approach for quality control. Um, it's also not necessarily the most sensitive. So we did uh, we did try to test it to see how sensitive it would be um, using the French Saison strain. So basically taking some Cali ale, um, infecting it with uh, different quantities of French Saison yeast, uh, which is a very strongly diastatic strain. And um, we were able to find that it was only sensitive down to about one in a thousand. So it's a pretty low sensitivity. So this would also uh, not not exactly be great for 
um, for active detection, quality control of diastatic yeast, but it is a good tool to characterize a strain and understand how, how much uh, starch degradation potential that strain has. So one of the common approaches that we see used by uh, by brewers uh, in yeast labs is, is detecting a related function. Um, the sort of gold standard for detecting diastaticus currently has been this stuff called LCSM, Linz Cupric Sulfate Medium. Uh, it's traditionally used to identify wild yeasts. Wild yeasts are resistant to copper. Um, they tend to have uh, they, they, they may tend to be more exposed to copper in the wild environment. And so consequently, uh, they, they tend to have more resistance to that. Um, we see that, um, especially if you look at, you know, wine yeasts and, uh, yeast that come off fruit, um, oftentimes copper is used in the fungicides, pesticides that are used to spray those, uh, fruits. And you often see, uh, quite a lot of, uh, copies of this copper resistant gene in those yeasts. Um, so consequently, um, it's a great it's a great way to test for wild yeast that are that are naturally resistant to this stuff, but you can also sometimes see false positives with things like wine yeast as well that have also had a reason to become resistant to copper. Um, interestingly, though, there there is a correlation with the STA one positive yeasts. In general, a lot of the beer two yeasts um, have more resistance to copper. Um, I think that was in the the um, Verstappen study, uh, Gallon 2016, where they sequenced all the beer yeasts. Um, a lot of those uh, beer two yeasts are also resistant to copper. Um, and in our case, for the STA1 positive yeast that we have in our bank, uh, we did find that all of our STA1 positive yeast do grow on that LCSM medium. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it'll grow in three days. Um, and then if, you, um, if you've if you got fresh LCSM, you can get the sensitivity down to about one in a hundred million. Uh, very, very analogous to the um, screening uh, with the PCR as well. So you can get an equivalent result to PCR from plating um, using LCSM. Um, and, and that's worth mentioning because this is, you know, an agar plate's always gonna be cheaper than running a PCR. Um, even if you're doing all of your PCR stuff in house um, with your own reagents, instead of buying kits, um, making a plate and plating on a plate is always, you know, quite a lot more affordable. Uh, there is a risk of false positive with, the, with these. We do have uh, a couple Belgian strains in house because they're beer two strains um, that are ST1 negative, but they grow on LCSM. Um, so it's, it is important to know your strains. Uh, I would recommend like screen your house yeasts on LCSM if you're looking to implement it in your QC program, because you may find that especially if you have a house Belgian strain that's non-diastatic, it may actually grow on LCSM. And so you need to know that because then all of a sudden, if a bunch of yeast is showing up on LCSM, uh, your lab tech might, you know, might be freaking out and, and you need to uh, do some further investigation. Also just wanted to uh, highlight some re recent research that was uh, shared by, by our friends in Chicago, Omega Labs, um, Omega Yeast Labs. Uh, they did a little bit of work on um, tweaking LCSM a little bit to increase the sensitivity of, of that medium to recover um, the yeast that are resistant to copper. Um, they made some adjustments to the copper sulfate and um, dipotassium phosphate concentration and swapped out um, one of the one of the other salts in that recipe. Um, and that's in their paper. Uh, you can find it on their website. Um, so that seems promising as well, especially when we talk about uh, being able to um, make sure that 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 medium remains uh, useful for for longer than 24, 48 hours. Uh, so we were able to use all of this information and kind of classify our, our house diastatic yeasts. Um, so we were able to, uh, we did end up screening through all of the yeasts that we regularly grow. And we have a collection of about 70, 75 yeasts that we are uh, maintaining um, regularly. Uh, we did screen every single one of them for STA1 just to be absolutely certain. Um, and, we, and we found a list of, of a few that, that were STA1 positive. And, and most of these are our Saison yeasts. We also see some of the uh, wild yeasts as well in here. Um, we've screened everybody on LCSM and there are some examples down here of yeasts that are um, not STA1 positive, but which uh, do grow on LCSM. So a wild yeast uh, from Nova Scotia or this uh, Trappist ale yeast uh, are some examples that, that do grow on LCSM but are not STA1 positive. So that is uh, one of the reasons why it's a good idea to check the 
uh, check the DNA, but also also check the function. It's great to have the PCR and the plating and have them complement each other. Um, you can also see that some of these are more diastatic than others. Um, there's sort of this group of strong uh, starch uh, activity, uh, medium starch activity, and low starch activity. Um, and, and you know that was interesting to us too because you know we had seen some reports that you know people were finding some strains really didn't hyperattenuate all that much, but then others would be you know burning through it right away, uh, blowing up cans in a week or two. So that that seemed kind of kind of odd um, and, and and definitely worth following up. Uh, luckily, uh, we we have um, a lot of uh, we have this awesome network of of people that are that are thinking about beer and researching beer yeast. And uh, I think at some point in 2018, I, I mentioned this this issue with Christopher Krogris, um, who we saw present uh, earlier this week, um, and he took an interest in in, in this stuff. And uh, so we sent him our strains. He was able to get some of the strains from Weinstefan that they uh, that they were studying as well. And um, put together this uh, this paper that you know, like I said, it really helped to sort of move us into the present day when it comes to diastaticus. So uh, thanks, Christopher, for, for for taking an interest in this uh, big industrial problem. So what did they find? This was sort of the big finding: is that there is a deletion in the promoter region of the weakly diastatic strains. So if you have a strongly diastatic strain it has this upstream activation sequence. And, and what those do in yeast genes is those uh, recruit um, the transcriptional machinery to produce more of that gene and in turn produce more of that protein, that enzyme. And that if this is missing, like for example, deleted in the weaker strains, then we presumably have less expression of that STA1 gene and therefore less of it present, therefore maybe less of the enzyme and potentially less activity. And they were able to confirm that. So strains with the deletion uh, grew less well in beer. Strains uh, with the fully intact promoter uh, were able to grow in beer a lot better. So that makes sense. So um, if they're expressing more of the gene, um, they have more of that diastatic function. And then they were able, also able to confirm that this is due to lower gene expression. So if they took a French Saison strain, they saw an enormous amount of expression of STA1. But if they deleted the promoter in that STA1 gene um, using CRISPR, uh, they saw that that expression dropped dramatically. And then also in another strain, um, WLP570, um, so the Duval strain, um, you also see that that one has a much lower expression of STA1. Um, which, which tells us that, that yes, that um, deletion in the gene promoter is, is really influencing how much of that gene is expressed and how much activity, um, diastatic activity, those yeasts have. Uh, that paper also offered us a new QC tool. So you can use PCR to detect that upstream sequence. So PCR primers were developed to detect that upstream activation sequence. Um, so for example, you can see in that French Saison strain um, there's an extra band here uh, in, that, in that PCR gel. Um, that is representative of the upstream activation sequence. Um, and then you see that that is missing in, uh, in this other strain and that there is uh, no STA1 or upstream activation sequence um, in this uh, non-diastatic strain. So that's a, that's a really useful tool for us. Uh, we were able to then use that um, you can uh, multiplex those, meaning that you can use both primer sets at the same time in the same reaction. Um, because they make different size bands, you can separate those out, um, which is super useful. We have seen some issues with uh, what's called background in non-diastatic uh, strains where some other things get amplified. So we're still making some tweaks internally um, for our processes so that we're getting less background in the non-diastatic strains. but. Uh, for characterizing diastatic strains, this does work really, really well. Um, so you can see, for example, um, in, this, in this experiment, uh, sample one and nine are STA1 negative, samples five and eight, they have that lower band, meaning that they contain the activation sequence. So those are gonna be the highly diastatic strains. And that these other ones are likely to be weakly diastatic because they have a deletion. They don't have that upstream sequence. So we were able to correlate that to uh, our house list of, of uh, um, diastatic strains. Uh, 
And uh, surely enough, uh, we saw that the strains with that intact upstream sequence, that lower band, uh, were the three strains that are the, the fastest growing on the starch agar. They have the most um, capacity for starch degradation. Uh, one thing I do want to flag is that the uh, upstream sequence negative strains, they can still consume starches and dextrins. Um, that does seem to be variable. Um, again, go and check out that, that uh, um, preprint from Omega Labs. They did uh, characterize a few of their strains uh, in some detail as well and looked at uh, um, some of the um, sugar consumption of those weekly diastatic strains. And it still seems like uh, the plot might get thicker um, as the research goes on. But I just want to flag that, that just because a yeast doesn't have that upstream activation sequence doesn't mean that it won't consume starch or dextrins. It likely just means that it's going to do so slower. So taking all of this information together and molding it into a QC program, what can we do here you know, as, as a brewer? Um, what we would recommend is, you know, like anything, try to make it as simple and efficient as possible. You can make the most, you know, intricate, complex, amazing QC program in the world, but then there's going to be one week where you just don't have time to do it and it's not going to happen. So try to make it easy for yourself, right? Uh, just like Alex was saying in the last presentation, you know, make sure you also have a place to keep your data because um, you can't do anything with data if it's not written down, right? Um, so that's also really important. So we do recommend if you're if you're worried about diastaticus and if you're packaging beer and sending it to stores, you probably should be worried about diastaticus. Um, plate your beer or your yeast onto LCSM. We typically recommend uh, 0.1 mil of yeast slurry or, or one mil of beer. Um, you can do more beer. Uh, if you've got a filtered beer, for example, you can uh, uh, run that beer through uh, a membrane filter and, and then uh, plate, uh, you can literally just stick that membrane um, onto the agar and that can get you more sensitivity. Just kind of depends on the beer. Um, and then if, if you don't see growth, great, good work uh, in general. Would recommend validating your LCSM every so often with a known diastatic strain just to make sure that you're not getting false negatives. Um, always a good idea. Um, if you do see growth, then you, you, know, you need to investigate and that's where you can go in and do the PCR. Um, if you have colonies of yeast on an agar plate, it's actually really easy to extract DNA from that yeast and do a PCR. You don't need these expensive kits. You can do it for you know three or four bucks. Um, so that's really beneficial, especially if you already have a thermocycler in house. Um, you can then do that PCR, that multiplex PCR for uh, the upstream sequence NSTA1. You can determine whether that contaminant yeast is high risk or low risk and make a decision from there. In general, if you're finding these things, uh, in the beer, you're going to at least be holding the beer and monitoring gravity change. I would see that if you see this, then you're probably going to be pulling and destroying the beer because, um, you know, the, the, the strongly diastatic strains can cause problems very quickly. This program can give you results in two to four days. Once you have a yeast colony on, on an agar plate, you can do the PCR in less than a day. You can get that result right away. Um, you don't have to do any enrichment steps or anything like that. So there, there is, uh, you, you can get the results you need relatively quickly with this program. And it doesn't necessarily require a huge time in investment, right? Um, I would say that if you've got a team of, you know, five or six people um, working in, in, in uh, production, you, you should be able to split the work and get it done um, with the proper training. There's always barriers to this stuff. You know, this is stuff that we hear all the time. We're too busy to run a lab. We're too small to run a lab. We don't have the money to buy lab equipment. And I think, and I hope that uh, some of our presentations earlier today helped to convince you that, that a lot of these are myths. Um, a lot of it just comes down to having the right uh, instruction and having the right um, system in place to, to, to get the work done efficiently. We tried insert system here and it didn't work for us. We hear that a lot too. And you know that, that breaks my heart because uh, I really want people to be able to do lab testing and I want it to be easy for them. We've never had an infection. You don't know until you look. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's an easy one to respond to. Or you know, our SOPs are rock solid. Well, are they? Are you are you are you challenging them? Are you are you validating them? Um, I would encourage you to dive into that. Um, and you know, it, it's in most cases not enough to to just have great SOPs. Uh, it's important to also do the monitoring so that you you have a mechanism to validate. Um, your standard operating procedures as well. So we talked about this earlier and I just wanted to flag uh, once again that it is possible to set up a QC program for relatively low cost. Uh, 
Um, you don't even have to invest in an autoclave and a, and a fume hood and things like that for or flow hood for agar plates. Uh, you can buy them pre-poured. Uh, we sell them. A lot of other yeast labs sell them as well. Um, these are available. Um, Bunsen burners to do your aseptic plating work are relatively cheap. Um, you can get the pipettes. I think we talked about um, the sort of entry level pipettes from this company. Mini PCR work pretty well. Um, you can actually get a thermocycler from these guys for, for about 650 bucks as well. Um, I think it just fits eight samples, but that can get you up and running with PCR for less than a thousand bucks, which is, which is kind of awesome. Um, you can get one of these systems to put your DNA on a gel and visualize it again, a few hundred bucks. This stuff used to be thousands of dollars. Uh, the last few years, all of this stuff has become way cheaper. Pretty much everything that you need to do in a lab has become radically cheaper in the last few years, right? You don't need to buy an autoclave if you can get like an instant pot with the sterilizer setting. Uh, you don't need to buy a, you know, an expensive water bath if you can get a, an Innova sous vide, right? So all of these things that are coming out that are making our lives in the kitchen easier can also help us in the, in the lab as well and save a ton of money. So that's sort of, you know, one of my take homes here is, you know, we've talked about diastaticus, but I think one of the things that a lot of you are wondering about is, you know, how can we actually set ourselves up to detect this stuff? And that's one of my answers is you can set up a lab that can screen for diastaticus for less than 2000 bucks in equipment and less than eight hours of work per week. Um, I guarantee it. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can always email us and we'll be happy to help you out. So moving on beyond that, how do we prevent it? And there's, uh, there's responsibility on all sides of the supply chain to um, prevent this from being an issue. So first thing is ask your supplier how they prevent diastaticus. We love getting these kinds of questions. It's not intrusive, it's not accusatory. I love telling people about how we operate because I'm really proud of how we operate. And oftentimes talking to customers even gives me ideas for how we can improve our processes. If I know what you guys are concerned about, I can implement changes in my lab uh, or, or elsewhere at Escarpment to make sure that uh, we are responding to your needs. So talk to your suppliers, keep that open dialogue. Really important to document and track your yeast lot numbers and your generations in your brew sheets. Uh, can't tell you how many times where we've, uh, we've been asked to, to, to help um, diagnose an issue and the brewer doesn't have uh, the lot numbers of the yeast. They don't have the generations uh, of the yeast in the brew sheets. They've had to go back and you know, try to piece the history together and there's always a lot of missing pieces. It is so much easier to do that sort of um, brewery CSI if you have the, the lot numbers and the generations. It makes it so much easier on everyone's end to uh, actually solve the problem. Also important, if you can run QC on the yeast in the beer, that's gonna give you data that you can use um, to know whether or not you have a problem. But on the other end, um, you can also use a proactive approach to manage your risk. And what does that mean? I'm gonna walk through uh, a proactive rich risk management approach. You may have heard of some of these concepts in the last few weeks, just, just maybe. And uh, there are sort of, sort of some central pillars of the risk management philosophy at Escarpment Labs that has really helped us in the last few weeks. And one of those is physical separation. Uh, keep risky yeast away from risk-prone yeast, right? If you've got a yeast that can cause big problems like diastatic yeast, you should physically separate it from a yeast that can be prone to big problems if that diastatic yeast gets into it. Handle it in order, right? Um, you never want to touch this yeast um, and then go back and touch some of this yeast because you're, you're radically increasing the chances of cross-contamination. So uh, for us, we're always handling things in order. If anyone is harvesting or packaging yeast, um, they're always going from level one to level two to level three, uh, never backward. And then always um, you know, resetting, sanitizing between products, uh, cleaning and resetting at the end of the day, and then starting the cycle over. Um, and we do try to keep, um, as many things as possible, sterile um, or disposable, and um, try to try to keep uh, as much physical separation as we can too, to the point where we, we try to use dedicated tanks and lines um, for anything that touches the diastatic yeast, just because of that um, potential for risk. What does quality control look like in a yeast lab? I think that this is true for a lot, a lot of yeast labs. 
Um, there are multiple QC checkpoints that are happening. Um, for us, we're checking the starter. So for us, what that looks like typically is it's uh, um, kind of like this homemade Carlsberg flask design um, that Nate came up with uh, that works really well for us to make a, a, a 20 liter yeast starter. Uh, we're plating that, that gets held. Uh, it doesn't get used to actually make yeast until that clears QC. Once that starter has cleared QC, it goes into the propagator. We grow the yeast. Uh, we check that yeast pretty much as soon as it's at the end of its growth curve uh, in the propagator. Uh, we're gonna wait till that's uh, cleared before we uh, go ahead and harvest that yeast. The yeast is harvested as a slurry. Uh, we're doing our plating uh, viability. Uh, we're also doing a test fermentation as well. To make sure that that yeast works like it's supposed to. Um, and then once that batch of yeast has received that triple all clear, um, all, all three of those uh, tests have passed with flying colors, we're able to release it to our customers. And I imagine that that's probably the case for, for a lot of yeast labs. If there is ever any issue with these, um, for example, we plate uh, our yeast onto LCSM. If we see anything abnormal pop up, uh, we'll do a colony PCR as needed to investigate. Um, and that is a way that uh, cross-contamination by diastatic yeast can be detected. Um, within a yeast lab or within a brewery. What does the future look like? The future is really exciting. There's a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to flag, just because I, I think this is really cool, and this is gonna, it's gonna be something that we are going to be working with um, a lot more heavily in the next little while, is um, this idea of on-site DNA sequencing. I know this sounds super sci-fi, but it's actually here now, and it's getting to the point where it's gonna be affordable and practical in a couple of years. Um, this company, Oxford Nanopore, they've developed these small-scale affordable DNA sequencers. Um, the one in the hand is called a, a Minion. A minion. Um, it costs a thousand bucks. Getting DNA data out of it is still expensive. There are still uh, um, some issues with these being error-prone, but it's getting better every day. Um, and I think that relatively soon it will be possible to gene sequence a beer DNA sample and be able to screen for contaminants and mutations in real time. So it will be possible to screen for contaminants um, in, a, in a yeast, for example. Um, you could screen that DNA and fish for STA1. You could fish for mutations that might mean that that yeast uh, is going to crap out and fail. And that's really exciting. Um, I do see the potential for cost reductions and um, some of the software solutions to come online to make this possible in breweries. Uh, although we're probably still a few years out. Um, really exciting stuff because um, a lot of this kind of stuff could eventually render the, the PCR itself obsolete. Um, one other option, again, uh, there's, there's a lot of topical things in this talk. Um, one of the other potential ways that we can detect diastatic is better is through antibodies. Um, so there are you know, lab tests out there that are used to detect antibodies to all sorts of different things. Um, and the cool thing about that is then you're detecting the protein itself. You have an antibody to STA1, it binds to STA1. Uh, it would allow you to fairly sensitively detect the STA1 protein in a beer. So even just taking a beer sample and putting it on something that looks like a pregnancy test could theoretically allow you to detect STA1. That being said, this stuff is way easier said than done. There's a large amount of uh, research and development that's required to troubleshoot sample prep, troubleshoot and create antibodies, and of course scale up uh, the detectors and, and make them widely available. So I imagine someone out there is thinking about this idea with, with diastaticus. Of course, we do have uh, collectively bigger fish to fry right now. So maybe we'll see some of these kinds of solutions um, come out in the future for brewers. And so just uh, sort of capping off this talk, I do wanna propose one idea. This is my sales pitch. Always try to keep it down to like one slide or less. Um, how can we make safe saisons? Um, we know that saisons are a popular beer style, especially in the summer, because they can make these really light, refreshing, uh, crushable, dry, effervescent beers. But uh, nearly all commercial saison strains are STA1 positive. So if you're bringing it into the brewery, you do run the risk of, um, potential issues with that yeast cross-contaminating other products. Uh, that gene function is beneficial for saisons to achieve the dryness. A sweet saison is kind of weird, maybe with exception to phantom saison, which makes it work, but um, most most saisons are quite dry. Um, so I, 
I, I do think that in the case of Cezanne's, that, that gene function is really beneficial. So one of the things that I'm not going to say we came up with, it's something we, we literally stumbled into. Uh, when we were screening our yeast bank, uh, we, did, we did pull out all everything that came out of bottles of Cezanne's um, for STA1. Um, and we actually found one from a bottle of a Belgian Cezanne um, that did not contain STA1. Uh, we we uh, amplified it. We noticed no STA1. Well, that's weird. The DNA prep must not have worked, but we did a control, uh, amplified a different gene in the yeast. It worked fine. We did it again. We did it again. Okay, we have a we have a yeast from a Belgian saison that that is that is STA1 negative, and so we were able to confirm that. And um, we did it, uh, tested it out in some some fermentations, and found that yes, it did have um, that characteristic saison uh, yeast flavor uh, that we were not able to achieve by using other yeasts. Um, plus plus a enzyme to break down the starches. Like we tried this with our Ardennes yeast. We tried this with, with, with a few different Belgian yeasts. And it was just like, well, it's not really a Saison. This one we thought really did taste like Saison. That being said, one of the limitations of the Saison Maison is you might be able to see that here in the final gravity. It's got a pretty average attenuation. It's not drying all the way out. Like this would be like where a, where like a spooky Saison or a French Saison would be. Um, probably closer to, well, spooky maybe a little higher, but... If you were to look at like a French Saison or dry Belgian, they'd be like way the heck down here. Um, this one does not really dry out as much. I would say it has very average attenuation, like more like a like a Cali Ale kind of thing. Um, so that is one of the challenges of it. We have had you know people use this yeast um, to make to make beers and then say you know okay this thing ended at at two point five Plato. I want it to be lower, and so there is a need to um, make adjustments in how the wort is produced or how the beer is fermented um, to get that target result. So um, one thing to flag there also is that this yeast does have high nutrient requirement, like all the Saison yeasts. And so to get that dry beer, you need a highly fermentable wort. Or what you can also do is dose an enzyme. So dosing uh, amyloglucosidase, um, the enzyme that's used to make brute IPAs, for example, um, pretty readily available on the pro side uh, i think on the homebrew side as well i think at least one of the yeast companies sells like smaller quantities of amyloglucosidase um that is available um to help break down um some of the residual starches and dextrins in that beer uh make them available to the yeast um what we typically have done for beers with saison maison is we'll dose that amyloglucosidase um Usually around this point, once once the beer is about three quarters of the way fermented, um, the reason being that if you dose it right at the start, you, you tend to create a ton of glucose units, and um, that can can have an impact on on the yeast sort of switching over to ferment the maltose. That can have an impact on flavor. Typically, if you have more glucose, you get more of that banana ester. I don't want a ton of banana ester in a saison, so. Um, we found it better to to dose um, an amyloglucosidase enzyme. Um, about mid ferment, um, and that can help to a get that beer dry, but b um, not alter the flavor of the yeast too much. And, and this can work very well. There are some um, examples of breweries uh, near us that have been able to make uh, shelf stable uh, saisons, put them in cans, get them out to customers, and not, you know sleep easy at night, knowing that um, they're not risking um, all of their other beers. So what's the take home message here? I know I've said a lot. Not all diastaticus are the same, right? Some of them have uh, really high capacity to um, break down starches and dextrin. Some of them are uh, relatively flimsy. Um, it's important to know which one is in your brewery and there are ways to, to check for that. Um, we need to be proactive about this too though. So if, if, you, if you are a brewery that's uh, regularly packaging beer, it's going out to distribution, it's sitting on shelves, um, in your local uh, the retail uh, alcohol monopoly, and uh, you don't have much control over that, then, then there is a risk. And so limiting diastatic yeast in those packaging breweries is a great idea. And uh, for that, we have proposed um, potential solutions to make safer saisons. And then, of course, you can detect this for surprisingly low price. Uh, we want to help breweries implement quality programs, even in breweries where, you know, where it was previously thought impossible. Um, we want to prove that it's possible. So if you're interested in that, in that kind of idea, um, drop us a line. We're happy to chat.
Cool. So that is the end of my discussion. And again, my email is there. It's very easy, Richard Um, You can also just uh, shoot us an email. Um, we're usually pretty quick to answer these things. Been trying to get back to all the questions that have come from these webinars. Um, and uh, if, if there's any that I missed, then I'll, I'll probably be following up next week. Uh, we've had a busy few weeks keeping these things going. Uh, and we are going to be taking a break next week. Uh, but then we're going to be right back at it um, the following week with some more webinars and brewer interviews. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Richard. That was great. Um, there's a few questions in, in the, uh, the function here that I, I want to get to, but I want to ask you a few questions first. So first off, I want you to run us through a little bit as to how, as Escarpment Labs, we bring a new strain on. Like when we're, when we're looking at new strains, what sort of testing do we do in regards to STA1? How do we, how do we actually process these things internally? Bring new strains on? Yeah. How, like when, we're, when we're screening for new, new strains and things like that, how, how do we kind of go through and determine, is it diastaticus, is it not diastaticus, things like that? Oh, okay. Um, so it's a lot more of a standardized approach than it used to be. I think in the past, it used to be kind of just like slapdash, like, hey, guys, I got this yeast from this bottle of beer that I brought back from Belgium. Let's start selling it. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit more standardized now. Um, you know, as we grow, we have to be a lot more careful with these things. And part of that is, um, is uh, making sure that the yeasts are well characterized. Um, so now at this point, if we're bringing on any, any new yeast for production, and that, that actually includes the yeasts that we um, bank for our clients and grow up for them, because you know, these yeasts are also things that are being grown in our facility that um, you know, have the same um, potential risks associated with them. And um, we do grow mm -hmm. diabetic yeast for clients as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> privately banked ones. Uh, there is a need to have like a standard method, right? So, so now when a yeast is is brought in, um, something new um, to be banked or to be tested, uh, what we'll do is we will identify what species it is, just based on on that that short ITS sequence. Uh, we will test it for STA one presence as well, um, ideally UAS. Um, and uh, if it has the, the STA1 uh, gene. And uh, we'll, we'll also uh, ideally check it on LCSM as well because you know the, you, you need to know, like for example, we have a, a couple non-Saccharomyces yeasts that do grow on LCSM. So you need to know that ahead of time. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, you're sort of dealing with I'm a the, fire. You know, lab tech being like, this isn't supposed to happen. It's like, well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you um, use any of our strains, you have a question about this, we can we can provide all this information to you. It's not like we keep this stuff kind of close to the chest. If you if you're using a certain strain, we'll tell you what all its properties to it. It's not these aren't trade secrets mm -hmm. or anything like that. This, this is shared knowledge. And, and I would say, yeah, like there's been a pretty considerable effort on our side to standardize a lot of the strain characterization. Like that was the reason for uh, the project behind the, the yeast strain diversity talk that we presented was um, not having all of that information in one place and really needing to have it. Um, and that was part of why we screened um, a lot of strains that, that were not released um, to customers previous to that mm -hmm. project um, that kind of emerged as winners. And, and we've been using that project as one of our sort of guiding lights to, to determine which yeasts should be um, on our schedule. Yeah. Um, the next one I wanted to ask, and I think this is something where the two of us may actually have a difference in opinion on this. Um, you don't say. <laughs> I know, shocking, right? <laughs> uh, how practical do you think it is for every single brewery to have its own PCR unit? And uh, before, I, I was kind of going to give you my my thoughts on this, is that there's a lot of things that can go wrong in PCR. And we've seen this with, with a handful of clients where they'll get a PCR unit in and they'll use it for a handful of months. They'll go going on with it. They detect all these things that are either false, false positives that are throughout their facility. And then they just kind of get tired with it and it stays on the shelf and becomes a very expensive paperweight and they're no better than they were beforehand. Um, yeah, I, 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 I see there being a lot wanting with PCR. I, I don't think it's kind of ready for the, the brewery market yet. Um, I want to kind of get your thoughts on that, on that statement. Cause I, I see this is something that's got kind of, kind of give brewery a false sense of, of not hope, but a false sense of security. Yeah, I think I think uh, the 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 key problem with with that side of the industry is that um, a lot of the companies that sell um, PCR systems, they're selling the advice and they're not selling the training. 
Yep. And what matters more? Does the thermocycler matter more or does knowing how to use it and knowing how to interpret the results, knowing how to pipette matter more? I think that the approach that's been taken by a lot of these companies is not the right one. And that agree. if more dollars were invested by breweries in the training, in learning how to do these things, um, they could invest in uh, very, very cheap equipment, like I mentioned, and get the same results. So yep. you know, my suggestion would be, cons you know, if you're looking at something that costs ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, consider investing that money in training your people. So your people are gaining skills, they're gaining knowledge, they're able to be better at their jobs, right? Be better lab tech um, and invest in the affordable equipment and in your people's brains. And you're probably going to see better results and better outcomes. Uh, the only counterpoint I would put to that is that if you're another way we see some clients operate is they'll they'll start doing LCSM testing internally. And I think LCSM really should be if you're if you're worried about this, that really should be your first line. That that should be like you know start playing all your beer on LCSM to see if you get growth. Because if you yeah, get growth, sure. then, then then that becomes a problem. And mm -hmm. I what I where I see breweries get kind of stuck or start having all these issues is when they don't use that functional test. They don't use LCSM as their initial line initial detection. Because a lot of these PCR units are, are kind of marketed as, yeah, you can get your data within 24 hours or within six hours. It's right there. It's wonderful. But yeah. the reliability of that isn't great. Yes, plating takes you 24 to 72 hours, but it's it's consistent and it's very highly accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I, My personal... Uh, so recommendation would be if you are if you think this is an issue start plating your beers now yeah i mean uh, I, I think I've had this, pcr i think i've had this debate with a lot of people too and, and i i i fully recognize that i am a i'm a very old school you know microbiologist you know and and that's my own bias that if you didn't plate it it didn't happen um yeah. pcr is useful but i don't think that it should be sort of the front line um, defense for QC. I do think that mm -hmm. PCR and plating can can complement each other really well um, because you know the, the the limitation of PCR is that it it doesn't tell you that 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 genetic material has come from something that's that's currently living, right? I would say that PCR complements plating, but plating doesn't complement PCR. You need to have you need to have plating first, and then then do your PCR. Yeah, that, that, that's, I would agree. That's, my perspective on this i would agree a lot, and, of, and, a lot of people push right past it they just go mm -hmm. straight to plating and it's and it's, it's a bad call yeah there's discussion in the in the last talk about um atp swabs as well and i think i think that those three can all form a, a holy trinity right like what happens if you're a brewery you made a saison and you know the brewer didn't clean the tank properly so there's a little bit of residue of saison yeast it's dead um but they you know you don't have an atp swab Mm -hmm. Then uh, someone fills that tank and the lab tech finds that and they're not, you know, not plating the lab tech finds uh, there's diastaticus in this on the PCR, but, you know, no yeast grows. Yep. It solved that problem by doing the ATP swabs and, and knowing whether or not the tank's clean. Right. Yep. So all of these things can work together really well. And my favorite line, my favorite thing we saw for this was that we had a bunch of breweries that were, you know, freaking out, tr finding uh diastatic positive genes, the, the, the STA1 was everywhere, and but their beers didn't actually have any diastatic yeast inside of them. It turns out that was there was a, a haze additive or something like that they were adding to their beers that was actually derived from STA1 positive yeast cells. So the, pro, the, dead, the sterile product they were adding to these beers was actually what was causing the positive result. And breweries were <laughs> freaking out. They're, they're, they're putting beer on hold. They're not packaging things because of non-functional contamination. I, it, it, if, if everyone just plated these things and did plating first, it would, the issue would have been gone. It wouldn't have been a yeah, problem. I've heard, of, I've heard of that happening. I think I think a, a few cases where that happened, where yeah, some kind of yeast extract that was made from a diastatic yeast uh, has has you know lit up as as diastatic as, as it should on PCR, but it's it's not alive. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, a few other things I wanted to bring up here are um, packaging line order, and this is something that I want to want to kind of emphasize because this is this is a functional thing that a brewery can kind of walk away with and, and take with this. Um, for the lab, we, we'll do say our all our level ones are clean ale yeasts, and then our POF positive strains, and then diastaticus. From from a brewery's standpoint, that means that you should be packaging your lagers first and your ales first, and then go into your visins, and then go into your saisons. You should never do your saison and then do your IPA. That's a horrible, horrible idea. 
Um, little yeah. things like that can have a huge impact on the quality of beer and the chance your beer is going to burst, explode, whatever you're going to look, whatever you want to look at. I just I wanted to bring that up and kind of meant, give you a chance to kind of add yeah. to it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like even even with it, I, even homebrewing, I do that. Like I usually yeah. bolt together my 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 homebrew bottling. Um, you know, four or five things at once, just because it's easier. Um, I, I just check the gravity of each of those beers and package them in that order. Like yep. even, even for a lot of my, you know, my beers where there's there's you know mixed mixed cultures and there is diastaticus for some of these things. Um, yeah, go in order because if you don't, you're probably going to have some problems with uh, overcarbonated beer, and uh, that's a problem. If, even if you're <laughs> on the wild and funky end. I have two more questions and then everybody else's questions. So these are these are kind of important bits that I usually hit when I talk, when I give this talk. Um, where in packaging lines? We, we, we've done a few QC jobs with this for a handful of different breweries. We can't obviously can't say names, but where in where in packaging lines do you often see diastaticus come live? Like where do you see not, it reside? Where do you where are the problem areas? Not the fill heads because everyone cleans the fill heads. No one cleans the seam droppers or the seamers. Or the you know whatever random plastic bits that surround the cans. Um, that's if you're swabbing a canning line, that's where you're going to find it. You're not going to find it on the fill heads because that's that's the part that everyone actually cleans. Uh, <laughs> so that's uh, that's my two. That's I have more than two cents on canning lines, but that's that's one of my suggestions is uh, look everywhere. Don't just look at the fill heads. You mean the seam dropper? Yeah. What, which the, part? Which portion? There's a there's a, a flap that comes down to drop the seams and beer because it's right next to the filler beer can can splash on it. I see what and you're so talking you about. Okay. Beer, you know, splashed beer from the last canning run that that can then you know get into Reside. the next canning run. I got you. Um, and this is a question that was brought up in the chat before we go into the rest. But what the hell's up with Dupont? Because Dupont has this, and you see this with some strains where they kind of they'll ferment aggressively all the way until ten twenty. And then just kind of hang out, and then maybe a, a week or two months later, plummet. Yeah, I just want. I, I have our theories on. You know, we've, we've talked about this in the past, but what, what do you think is happening here? Yeah, and I think you can. You can. Um, some of the things we talked about in the past can help with that. Um, number one, saison yeasts have surprisingly high nutrient requirements. So if that yeast is not getting the nutrients it needs, that may cause it to stall out. Mm -hmm. um, number two. Um, as we talked about in in um, back in yeast basics, um, uh, some yeast really do respond from a, a open fermentation environment. They they seem to uh, have a better response to that, and uh, some of the saison yeasts also seem to, to sort of fall in in that category. Um, it does sort of point toward you know potentially a higher oxygen requirement. Um, there's there's a higher oxygen thing. requirement to turn that gene on, right? To turn the the STA one complex on. There, right. there. Yes, um, I don't know that off the top of my head right now. Um, yeah. Maybe Christopher can can comment um, in the side here. But yeah, I know that there are some some oxygen related implications for um, STA one being being transcribed or active. Okay, uh, this is a good segue into the first question that that was on the top most top most rated one. Um, does it really matter wort fermentability when using diastaticus yeast? So do I have to convert? Do I not have to convert? Um, I want to highlight one thing that Christopher Post put in the uh, the side, and I've heard this before, is that if you if you take a diastaticus yeast and you knock out the STA1 gene, so it's no longer diastaticus, so the, so the diastatic genes are no longer functional. These strains typically aggressively poorly under under ferment, like they're very poor fermenters because they use they they they've lost the ability to consume maltotriose effectively, yep. or, or they do so yeah. very poorly. Yep. Um, and I know we have some clients where they do like a they make saisons with like a four minute mash. And uh, we also have some, some people who are very adamant about, you know, extended mash durations and things like that. So what are your, what are your thoughts on the fermentability of your wort and the uh, use of diastaticus? Yeah, it's kind of a funny thing. Cause I, I would, I would probably guess that, a yeah. Um, with a relatively poorly fermentable wort, you can still have it dry out to, to almost nothing with diastaticus. I'm a big fan of getting value out of the grains and, you know, doing a full mash to get that efficiency, but you know, all the power to you. Um, if you want to do a four minute mash, sure. <laughs> um, uh, I, 
again, like I, I think the you know, like oh, the the STA one is doing a lot of the heavy lifting there, right? The, the yeah. East has actually lost the um, uh, transporter for Malt Trios um, AGT one, and so yeah, the STA one is doing almost all the heavy lifting to get it through all those sugars. So yeah. um, I would expect that yeah, even in a relatively poorly converted wort, um, you'd probably still be able to get through most of that. It's kind of a logical follow-up between the last two questions. So I've heard things, this is all strictly anecdotal. I haven't seen any, any research on this, but if we are, say we are in those two options, we're using a strain that's weakly diastatic, like the, the, the Duval strain um, or the, you know, the classic DuPont culture. What do you think the impact would be of negative, of under converting that wort? And the argument here is that by under converting the wort, you're producing less glucose, less simple sugars for the yeast cell to use. Therefore, you're, you're causing the yeast cell to have to turn on that STA1 earlier in the process, early in the fermentation. I'm curious, have, you, have you seen anything like this or read anything about this? I, I've, I haven't seen, I've heard anecdotes on both sides saying, yeah, it's great and no, don't do it. So I, I'm, I'm at a loss. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, in, in general, um, I, I would think that it would still ferment faster if it had more fermentable sugars present. Yeah. Um, versus turning on STA, turning on a weekly expressed STA one sooner, you're probably just going to have a really, really slow tail end of fermentation. That, that's kind of where that's more my gut would say to go to, but you know, yeah. I, I'm, I, I would be happily proven wrong if that was the case. <laughs> yeah, it was still lots more science to be to be done here, and I, and I hope that it happens. Yeah, me too. We're not we're not, but we don't know any. We don't know everything on this. We're uh, we're still learning on how mm -hmm. on how this thing functions. Mm -hmm. um, how come when testing slash plating for diastaticus, we look at LCSM and not LWYN? Um, when it's a sac type yeast, is is sorry, is it still diastatic if is diastaticus if there is evidence of it, but growth on LWYN but not LCSM? But I think why, why do we why do we use LCSM and not LWYN? It's kind of the core of the question. So less Saccharomyces yeast will grow on LWYM. So LWYM is another selective medium, just like LCSM. Um, it uses uh, uh, fuchsin and crystal violet to uh, inhibit growth of things. Um, it, it works really well for inhibiting, for inhibiting Saccharomyces and selecting for non-Saccharomyces wild yeasts, like, you know, Brett, Pickia, things like that. Um, most sacs don't grow on it, so that's 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 the reason for for not using it for detecting diastaticus. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we checked all of our diastaticus strains on on LWYM. You know, full disclosure, but um, yeah, just the, the fact that all of our 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 diastaticus strains do grow on LCSM and most yeasts do not is you know really um, useful for a quality program. Yep. Like uh, LWYM, yeah. great if you're worried about non Saccharomyces wild yeasts. Um, like, uh, if you're barrel aging Imperial stouts, for example, and you're worried about Brett and stuff like that, then yeah, absolutely do it. All right. Um, when we do wild captures, how often do we see diastaticus? Why don't... We see it, um, which is confusing because, um, what we know from the genetics is that these are all Belgian brewing strains. So we're pretty confident in our in our methods of, you know, keeping keeping the lab away from the the wild sample, but um, some weird stuff there. And we've seen it in a lot of cases of people uh, getting wild yeasts. You know, a lot of the wild yeasts that that, that were sent in for banking, for example, that people have um, captured or isolated themselves are also STA one positive. So. I think that the story might go deeper in the future as more STA1 positive yeasts are, are genome sequence. Like we've seen it pop up in hybrid yeasts as well. Um, some of the ones in, in Lithuania, um, for example, it, you know, it shows up and there's, there's one, one Vizen yeast that's a hybrid that has STA1. And so we're seeing it pop up in more places. So maybe as more, more sequencing is done, we might find, find it show up in more places, but that is a bit of a mystery because it's, you know, supposed to be a trait specific to Belgian brewing yeast, but we every so often find it in wild Canadian yeasts. Yep. It's a, it's a weird, it's a very weird scenario on that one. Yeah. Um, there's about two, 
sorry, one big question I want to ask, but we're going to fill in kind of a smaller question in, in the intermediate. Um, does the use, usage of diastatic malt, could it produce a, uh, or I guess maybe what the core of this question is, would you recommend over converting your, your beers in order to reduce the, the impact of a diastatic disease contamination? So if you're a brewery that isn't able to actually screen for these things, for whatever the reason is, um, what, what kind of procedures can you do and can you put in place in order to mitigate the impact? And I, I would agree with the question here that, you know, yes, I would run, I would want my beers to finish as dry as possible. So if diastatic hits them, it's, it's less impactful, but. Yeah, no. And I agree with that, that, that having, uh, you know, your standard beers finish at a lower, gra uh, final gravity would help. Uh, mitigate those risks and uh, if there's ever you know I will take every opportunity to tell people uh, please try step mashing uh, yeah. <laughs> it'll change your life one of the things I'll, it'll I'll do is it'll make that. your beer more I'll fermentable <laughs> sorry I'll follow up with that please try step mashing <laughs> <laughs> we should have a whole talk on step mashing yeah uh, <laughs> there you go that being said, like there are some beers where that just doesn't make sense, right? If you if you've got a pastry stout, if you've got a New England IPA, a lot of those are finishing at you know four four Play Doh, ten sixteen. Um, some of those beers, if those beers are too dry, then the flavor balance is just is is not right. So, uh, in general, it's that's a good that's good advice, but it doesn't always work for some of the beers that the people are actually making and selling. Someone in the comments says that they found STA one, I believe, in a wild cave irish sorry irish cave wild yeast which is kind of neat cool that's a, that's a little wild um the thing that we'll keep we'll top the whole thing off with the last question this is a a question that i i think is really important for everyone to kind of change their framing on this topic um it's a bit large what do you think poses a larger risk to a brewery diastaticus or pretenomyces and a, an important follow-up bit in here is what do you think is more difficult to deal with when it comes to handling? Like, you know, a lot of facilities will have a Brett facility, like a Brett portion or Brett equipment, and then everything else. Um, where do you kind of sit on sh where that line should be drawn or sh what, what should you, what should you fear the most inside of a brewery, so to speak? Uh, yeah. Short answer is diastaticus and diastaticus. Um, yeah. Brett has a At bad reputation. Oh, go ahead. I'll point this out that we, we, we do QC for breweries all the time. And we've, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, we have not seen Britannomyces cause ex, like bursting or explosions. But diastaticus does this all the time. Like Britannomyces yeah. will change flavor. It will make the beer gush. It will make the beer overly carbonated, but it won't explode. Well, what we saw, what we saw, um, including in, in Caroline Tarava's talk yesterday, is that Brett's really slow, right? You know, anything that Brett does is going to happen at a glacial pace as compared to Saccharomyces. Um, so that is part of part of my answer is that, you know, Brett is so slow that even if you have a problem, you're going to you're going to be able to detect it and deal with it before it's really yep. a problem. Um, if we look at, you know, incidents of Brett contaminations in beers, um, at least, you know, obviously I can't name specific examples, but, you know, anytime that we have encountered Brett as the causative agent of overcarbonation in a beer, um, it has been in a barrel aged beer. Uh, we have never seen Brett as the causative agent of overcarbonation in non barrel aged beers. Um, not not to say that it's impossible, but that it's less likely than diastaticus. Far less likely. Um, Brett's really good at surviving in environments where no one else will, like like a barrel where there's you know high alcohol and no nutrients left and a little bit of wood and you know brett will be able to scavenge all of that and and and, and eco to living uh where other yeasts won't right so that's sort of where it thrives um if you were to put brett and diastaticus into a can of beer um and you know say go um chances are the diastaticus is going to win it's going to be faster oh, yeah. uh, so that that would that that's that's sort of my reason for that i i would um i, I understand that um, that, that, you know, Brett has a reputation. Um, it really bugs me that Brett has this reputation. I think a lot of it is carried over from, from the wine world. Um, especially because if you look over at the wine world, right, like probably not half, but a, a lot of the products are, are high alcohol barrel aged, uh, for a long time. So a lot of the products that they're making are at really high risk of Brett being an issue. 
Whereas if we look at beer, a lot of these beers are not at nearly as high risk, right? We're not going to be leaving our lager in a barrel for two years and hoping that it comes out clean on the other end, right? So I think a lot of our fear of Brett has has come over from the other side um, and, and infected us more so than the Brett itself. Um, yeah. And Brett's it's the it's that... forever, but you kind of have to put it in its place um, to get it to, to stick around. And the severity of what of a diastaticus plays instead of like from just from the what the the risk it poses to a brand or a brewery is just so much higher than Brettanomyces. Like if you have a Brettanomyces contamination, like your pale ale, unless the person's sitting on it for six months, they're probably not going to notice it. We, obviously, exceptions to that, but it's it's not it's slow moving, as Richard said. Um, I, I would I do want to kind of bring this up because this is. I think kind of is a really good example on this. There are some some clients of ours in, in the in the province that you know they make a lot of sour, funky beer. And they make a lot of clean beer, and the way they handle this is they have you know they have equipment for clean, they have equipment for funk and kind of mixed ferment, and then anything that has diastaticus, they don't even put through their own canning line. They get an, a mobile canning line to come to their facility and use that, because this way it doesn't go through their own packaging equipment, like. The, the, even breweries that are designed to have these different streams don't want diastaticus touching anything else other than what is minimally required. Like diastaticus has a huge impact on a lot of different brands, on a, on, on, on a brewery's bottom line. You know, if you don't use this stuff properly, you don't treat with enough reverence, it can, it can cause lawsuits, literally. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the worst stories I've heard from this was a diastatic con contamination on a grocery store shelf where someone picked up the can, the can exploded in their hand and shot metal into their hand. And there is a lawsuit about that and it settled out of court and all sorts of stuff. But that like that's that's what diastaticus can do if you don't kind of treat it properly. Um, Brett won't do that. Brett, yeah. it's diastaticus, you need to be careful with it. You need to treat it properly. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've been we've been doing and and you know been fortunate to do is um the mobile canners know this is an issue, and a lot of them are are really putting energy into boosting their knowledge around this stuff and, and being yeah. more proactive as well. Um, you know, to the point where, you know, we, we've had some of the mobile canners um, around here, um, you know, consult with us and ask like, hey, yeah. you know, what should we do here? Should we have a, a diastaticus line, right? Should we have a bread line? Do. Um, and, you know, glad that, that, uh, that, that these questions are getting asked. Yeah, the, the, the last kind of bit to wrap up that question, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll finish the whole thing. Um, in order, in order to try to kill diastaticus, diastaticus will die like any other yeast cell. So caustic is really great at getting rid of it. Um, I am a big, big fan, and everything I describe is kind of driven around this is that heat kills all, regardless. Um, if you use, if you boil in your lines, or if you if you can steam sterilize, I know it's not possible for everyone, but if you can keep your tank above eighty five degrees Celsius for fifteen minutes, things not not much is going to survive, if anything. Um, I, I would recommend that if you are really trying to get rid of something or you think you have a contamination, I, my, the first thing I go to is heat and it works very, very well. Um, if you're able to pull it off. Yeah. yeah. Heat's always better than chemicals. If, if, yeah. if, if whatever material it is, is, uh, can stand up to that heat. Yeah. Soft, soft parts and things that can't often do so for long periods, but heat is the best at killing things period. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, I think that's we've been talking for about an hour and a half. This is really on diastatic. This is really good. Again, this is this is uh, this is diastatic as 101. So we're not done with this topic. Uh, maybe we'll do 102 at a at a later point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I think we're we got to wait for for some more uh, more research to come. But I think it's I think I think it's on its way. So me too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. With that, we'll uh, we'll wrap up today and we'll wrap up a scarpcon. Everyone, thanks for uh, for coming by. Thanks for spending some time with us. Hopefully, you guys learned a lot. And uh, yeah. So Richard, you have anything else you want to wrap up and say? No, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for uh, for for uh, participating, especially you know people participating in the chat, asking questions. I sort of see yeah. uh, a few a few familiar faces and all these things, and that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, really cool to sort of create this kind of community. Um, I know I know you know things outside are not the best right now, but uh, you know, it feels like this was a push needed to to start to create something like this, and uh, we're going to keep pushing, and you know, in the, in the future to 
um, you know, stick to our mandate of, of bringing you guys knowledge and, uh, and and helping you guys with your fermentations. Yep. And if there's anything you guys want us to talk about, I see some things flooded in, in the chat. But you know, send us an email. Let us know. We'll see. We'll uh, we'll add them to the list, and we'll you know eventually we'll we'll get a talk on that duck going. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for showing up. I think that uh, I think that's a wrap. Right. Take care of yourself and uh, stay safe. Cheers. <laughs>